It is one o'clock. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our St. Patrick's Day Thursday Conversation Cafe, which is on sustainable transit in Charleston. So a little bit about MUSC Sustainability Department. Our mission is to build healthy communities by inspiring and implementing solutions to environmental, social, and economic challenges. Um, so our uh, initiatives are listed here, and the one that we're focusing on today is transportation. So a couple of things here. Seen is actually going to put these links in the chat. We do have a monthly newsletter that you can sign up for at MUSC's website online. We are also on basically every form of social media as MUSC Go Green, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. We are also on Yammer, MUSC's internal platform as broadcast sustainability. And we'll post about events like this along with other things going on on all of these platforms. And stay tuned for next month's event. Uh, Earth Day is happening in April. So we're thinking of having an event tentatively on the 20th, tentatively on our climate action plan kickoff. Um, last month, we presented on our greenhouse gas accounting project, and that's the first step in creating a climate action plan. So hopefully we'll get that rolling next month. Um, otherwise, just stay tuned on what that topic will be. And you can do that through signing up for the newsletter and the other platforms that I mentioned. All right, so today we have a lot of speakers to talk about green transit in Charleston. First is going to be Sharon Hollis, who is joining us now, and along with Michelle Emerson, who is the marketing and communications manager. Uh, they both work at the BCD COG, the Berkeley Charleston Dorchester Council of Governments. <laughs> uh, Sharon will be updating us on the LCRT and the transit-oriented development. Hey, Sharon, there you are. And if there's time for the presentation, Michelle will be giving an update on Carta. I know that she has a couple of things that she'll definitely want to be giving an update on. After that, uh, we will hopefully have Jason Kronsberg from the City of Charleston. He's the Department of Parks Director. He'll be giving us an update on the Ashley River Pedestrian and Bicycle Bridge. And then we have a couple of people from MUSC to speak about green transit right over here. We have Jay Henderson, who's the manager, along with Brittany Eason, the communications coordinator, and they both work for the University Transportation Services. And then we'll have Angie Brown, the program manager, and Gwendolyn Fleming, this manager, for the University Parking Management. Uh, as well, at the end, I will be giving a little update on uh, Charleston's new bike share program, which we're all very excited about. All right, so I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Sharon, to give us an update on the LCRT. Great. Thank you for in, inviting me to present today. I had a little bit of tech, technical difficulties getting on, but I think everything's working now. Um, but I'm going to present the transit-oriented development study that the BCD COG recently completed and is, is available on our website and was adopted at the last uh, BCD COG board meeting. Um, so I'm just going to give an overview of what we did in the study, highlight a few things we talked about in the medical district, and then, of course, invite you to um, take a look at the documents and do a deeper dive into the those and, and of course we'll be able to answer any questions you may have. But I'm assuming everyone that is on this call is familiar with the Low Country Rapid Transit Project. I am the principal transit planner at COG that is managing that project. And as part of that project, we did the transit oriented development study. So the study covered the entire um, 21 mile uh, transit corridor from the fairgrounds to the, the medical district um, and all 20 stations, but it also covered the future extension into Somerville to provide some, some information for the town that they could use in terms of um, how they can be transit ready for, for high capacity bus rapid transit in the future. Um, just to give you a quick update on LCRT, we have submitted our documents into the Federal Transit Administration's grant program and are awaiting um, from them a decision on when we can um, enter engineering to continue the design. So we hope to hear from them within the next month and we'll be cranking that project back up um, this summer and fall. 
But today I really want to talk about the transit oriented development study. Um, we, we probably have met with with many of you and, and even with this group as we were going through the process. It was a two year study, um, but it's really about looking at the station areas that quarter mile to half mile radius around the stations and to see how we can create compact walkable mixed use development. A lot of what you already have in the medical district, um, but also to make it much more accessible to the folks that are riding transit. So that 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 five to 10 minute walk distance um, to the station and really looking at ways we can support ridership along that corridor, but also attract some some of the development that really um, is needed to to support that BRT in those station areas to to create these types of places. Um, so it's really a strategy for optimizing development patterns in station areas. So uh, it's supporting high transit ridership. Transit needs to go where people go. That's one of the reasons the medical district is one of our highest transit ridership bases because there is a high concentration of employment and students and, and, and folks that are riding transit into and out of that district. But it's also about looking at the station areas and really creating a positive economic impact with the system. So how can we uh, catalyze infill and redevelopment in areas that may not be seen Seeing some of the growth that's coming to our region and create new employment clusters without having to, to add more vehicles to the roadway. And then most importantly, it's about providing equitable access, ensuring that the walk bike connections are there in the station area so that people can get to the housing and to the transit and having the things that they need in these station areas. So it's part of the first phase of the transit oriented development study which we refer to as TOD um, we took a look at our region and said what does TOD look like in the in the low country because it's not a one size fits all what you see in in some parts of the country would not necessarily work in the low country with our um, with our development uh, patterns and with our population and with some of the constraints we have with development but there's some key principles that we look at in terms of how we can find areas where there's maybe excess parking that could be utilized for, for better development, affordable housing, improving those walk bike connections, um, de development density. So can we get more density closer to the stations where it makes sense? Of course, looking at parking policies and, and really creating a sense of place around these station areas. We did have a lot of engagement as part of this process. We started before COVID, um, before the pandemic, and so we did have some some community workshops. We did have one down in, near the medical district as well, as well as a lot of um, uh, stakeholder interviews. Um, we did some design charrettes um, on particular station areas, including the medical district, which I'll talk about, um, and also um, held a lot of um, workshops um, in person pre-pandemic and then virtually um, after after we kind of stopped having those in-person meetings. But out of that work that we did, we had several documents, all of which are available on our website. The first thing we did is we took a look at the um, our market in our region. Where Where is development going and what do we expect through 2040 in terms of employment, retail, housing? And then we looked at if we made this investment in low country rapid transit and put these stations in these key locations, how much of that development could be attracted to these station areas, how much can it absorb? And as part of that, what, what can they absorb in terms of creating more affordable housing? Because placing housing near transit really helps to um, solve two very high, um, high cost items for a family housing and transportation. Um, and then we took a look at what we learned from that market assessment and we assigned place types to each station area to really put together some high level conceptual plans, which I'll, I'll highlight here what we did in the medical district. Um, but from that analysis, what we discovered is that that uh, based on the trends, and this was all done pre-COVID, so we will be um, reevaluating this in the next phase of the study to make sure these numbers still hold true. But but the way we were trending at the time, um, we anticipated having 1.4 million people in our region by 2040, um, and six over 600,000 jobs, and some of those were through retail, through office, through hotel. And so we took a look at our growth and and what the BRT would attract with these station areas and with transit oriented development so that we could assign that growth to station areas where it makes sense. And one of the areas where we saw the biggest opportunity in the station areas is for more housing, um, particularly in this corridor. So we did do a, a 
uh, a housing affordable housing briefing book, which is on our website. But um, some of the things that we learned about our particular region and about this corridor um, was was were the folks that were were what we call cost burden when it comes to housing. So if they spend more than 30% of their income on housing, regardless of what the income level is, that's considered cost burden. Um, owners or cost burden renters. But what we did see, particularly in this corridor, we have a much higher percentage of cost burden um, uh, residents. And, and that's at a much higher rate when you look at um, people who um, who rent versus own people of color, low income individuals and frontline workers. And so there's really an opportunity in this corridor to really create a mix of housing to accommodate the needs in our region. So you'll see a series of recommendations along the corridor um, in terms of policies and ways to, to improve and support the affordable housing efforts that are going on in, along this corridor. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the place types, particularly in the medical district. Um, as I said, we assign place types to each of the um, station areas. Of course, the medical district being um, in downtown Charleston, it really had some of the larger, more more dense place types already in place. So, so a lot of the recommendations weren't really about adding more density, but more about how we can make the, the development and the accessibility work. Um, but we did assign place types to all stations along the corridor from the fairgrounds down to the medical district and included Berlin G. Myers, which is in the Somerville future extension. And the place types really focused, focused on building density, um, the number of jobs and households um, and, and dwelling units per acre. But really they were a guideline and each station area was evaluated based on what's planned and what is, and what is um, um, able to be absorbed in our market and modified to fit that station area. And we looked at um, the, each station area with that information and we applied the TOD design principles. So how can we incorporate grid, gridded streets and walkable block sizes where they don't exist? Where can we add more density near stations where it makes sense? How can we uh, improve Improve the bike and pedestrian infrastructure um, within that half mile radius to make those key connections. And of course, looking at housing diversity and, and how we can uh, incorporate stormwater management, parks, open space, and things of the nature. And we developed station area concept plans. So there's one of these plans for, for every station um, in the document. So if there's a particular area you're interested, you can go in. Uh, some of them are more detailed where we took a deeper dive to help the communities visualize how TOD can transition over time. It's not an overnight um, scenario. It could take 20 to 30 years for TOD to be put in place. And the key is to have the tools today to allow for that development to come and that, that uh, TOD to form over time. So we did do a design charrette um, with um, the medical district, stakeholders, community members, um, municip municipalities, and, and, and folks that are uh, engaged in that area, including MUSC, and took a look at, at what the three stations in, in the medical district, um, which are at Jonathan, St. Lucas, and Calhoun, uh, Courtney and Dowdy, and of course the West Edge at, at Lyme and Haygood, to see how we can improve the, the connectivity, how we, what, what is planned in terms of development and where are there opportunities um, for additional development and what does that development look like. So I'm going to highlight a very quickly and high level some of the, the recommendations that came out of that study um, as part of that conceptual analysis. And in the next phase of work we'll be doing, we'll be refining these based on the specific needs and recommendations that have been highlighted um, as priorities to further the planning and design. Um, and so for the Line and Haygood station, it was identified as a downtown neighborhood center, which means it could have the potential to accommodate more housing. And so we did as assign more housing to that particular district, um, understanding what's in place um, today, what's already planned. But some of the key recommendations that came out of that particular station area were to, um, of course, um, improve bike and pad infrastructure, uh, to increase some of the housing supply at all market levels, um, to, to convert some of that surface lots to structured par parking, which is already 
I think part of the plans in that station areas. Um, joint development um, is, is occurring today, but it's a great opportunity um, for some of the publicly owned land to really create some, some parking structures and some tra transportation infrastructure projects through a joint development type of program. Of course, stormwater and flood mitigation was a, a priority for all three stations. And then the Hay Good extension was identified as a priority for that connectivity of this station. The next station we looked at was Courtney and Dowdy. Um, and that station, very similar to, um, to the West Edge side, except for it was more of a downtown employment center. So we didn't really assign a lot of housing to this particular district, but we did recognize that there is an opportunity um, as that as as that area tra transitions, as as um, things get rebuilt or, or rededicated to other uses, an opportunity for public private partnerships to support affordable housing in and around this district. So while it's not specifically called out in, in numbers here, there is definitely that opportunity there. And then of course, a lot of the same recommendations we saw at um, the West Edge. One that really stood out differently from this one was an employer-based transportation demand management program. One of the things we heard is there are a lot of users of these roadways from transit to walkers to uh, emergency vehicles to bicyclists and really coming up with a way to manage all of the demand on that network um, will be a critical part of ensuring that that TOD can be successful in this corridor. And lastly, Calhoun and Jonathan Lucas. Again, this is another um, downtown neighborhood center where we see an opportunity for, for additional housing. Um, a lot of these stations overlap, and so that's one of the reasons you see some of the same areas. We did a half mile radius, um, but these stations are closer. Um, because it's a much more denser um, district, we could, we could justify putting those um, stations closer together to really hurt, hit those key activity points. But I'd say that the, similar to the other ones, bike pet infrastructure, infill and redevelopment, whether it's surface parking or, or underutilized land. And then of course, um, looking for opportunities to add affordable housing. Throughout the entire study, we set a target of 20% affordable housing in each of these station areas to really help focus um, our future efforts on how we can implement that in these station areas. So we've just wrapped up phase one of the study and all of those documents are on the Low Country um, Rapid Transit website, but we did receive a federal grant to start the next phase, um, which will really refine some of those key areas that, that stood out in the station areas, the bike uh, and ped infrastructure being one of those. So working with the municipalities to really focus on how we can develop those capital programs um, to, to improve the bike and pedestrian connectivity to the LCRT stations beyond what the project is doing. Um, looking at um, joint development and economic development opportunities in some of these station areas. And, and then of course, um, supporting the affordable housing work that's being done throughout the region. One of the other things that we've highlighted to do in this next phase is to develop a dashboard so we can measure our success to see how TOD is developing over time and make sure that what we're doing is, is actually working. And so we did receive funding as part of that grant to create that dashboard so we can track our, our progress. So I mentioned our, our web website. It has all of the information, um, not just about Low Country Rapid Transit, but there's also a page that's called Livable Communities. And that has all of the documents that we created as part of the TOD study. It's a lot of information. It's a lot to go through. It is currently, um, we are accepting comments on those plans. So please, uh, we encourage everyone to take a look at them. If you have any comments, any thoughts, or any ideas, as we start to work toward the scope of the next phase, we certainly want to get feedback of what we need to be focusing on in that next phase. So that kind of is my very quick and very um, brief um, overview of a very big, big study that was over several years, but I can answer questions that are um, here now or, or we can hold those however you want to do it. Yeah, thank you so much. Sydney had a couple of really great questions that we can try to answer super quickly so that Michelle can try to get her updates. Uh, Sydney was wondering if there's a way to ensure that the housing belt will be affordable housing. Um, so maybe through the dashboard that you were talking about, 
would that be on there? Yeah, so some some of it will be policies that will need to be put in place. It won't happen without government intervention. So that's one of the things we'll be looking at. Uh, we identified a lot of potential policies um, as part of that briefing book. And what we'll be doing in the next phase is really looking at those. OK, how do we put these in place and, and what do they look like? So yes, th there will need to be some policy to ensure that it happens. OK, great. And then I know that the flooding infrastructure re for resilience purposes was under your recommendations, but Sydney, uh, her question is, are there thoughts about promoting sustainable development and eco-friendly climate resistant structures, especially downtown where flooding is worsening? We didn't get into that level of detail in these plans, but that's certainly a recommendation that could, could be applied to those policies and those tools. Sure. Cool. Thank you so much, Michelle, if you want to hop on and do your update super quick. Um, again, this is Michelle uh, Emerson, Marketing Communications for BCD COG. Um, I have a couple people here with me. Um, we have John Dodson, our transit planner, and we have Courtney Cherry, our new van pool coordinator. Um, and so just wanted to make sure that I introduce them to you. Um, because uh, they will be able to help if there's any questions, as well as if there is any um, interest in some of the programs that I am about to share with you very quickly. OK, so wanted to really quickly go through a few updates that we have for Carter with a few of the programs um, that I have brought to you guys before. Um, and so hopefully you guys can get some information and still kind of help us out with some of the things. Um, the first one that I wanted to make sure to let you know about is Carta On Demand. Um, we launched this program about a, a little over a year ago as a pilot program where we partnered with Uber and YouServe uh, to provide additional transportation options for our current Telluride customers um, and for seniors that are 55 and older. And so, um, of course, we, you know, that was during time of you know, a lot of uh, COVID at that point. And so we have had some reception, but it hasn't been a tremendous amount. Um, and so we are still looking for folks to be able to use this. It's a great program. Um, it's not meant to replace what our current paratransit is. It is actually to work in conjunction with it um, to provide additional options for folks. And specifically when it was started, it was started primarily going towards Telluride customers and making sure that they had better accessibility to medical care. And so at the heart of it, that's still what this program was about and continues to be about. And that's why it's so important that I uh, make sure I let you guys know what's happening with this. Um, I think you guys, a few of you did give us some information on maybe some clinic managers or some area managers that we could talk to specifically to give them information um, on how to utilize this because you guys would know your um, clients, customers a whole lot better than we would. And so you know who may have, be having some transportation issues. Um, the big difference between this program and what we currently offer Telluride is that it's same day service. So if someone you know is in danger of missing a, a second appointment, which we know is a very high percentage, um, this is the service that would be able to help them out. If they needed a ride home and you know that they need to be able to get home, this again is another way to help them out. In particular, the USERV option um, is the one that we're really trying to increase because that's the option that is definitely helping those who have any type of um, ambulatory issues and that are more Telluride um, riders in that case. Uh, the concern is that it's a possibility that if we don't get this program moving a little bit more that we may actually lose it um, or it may have to be modified. Um, so again, if you guys have anyone that you think that may be interested in this or have any questions about it, please give us a call, send us an email. I'm always available. Um, we the one other thing as far as a uh, update with this program is instead of just medical appointments, um, they can now go to anywhere in the Carter service area. So that very much so mimics what Telluride does. Um, so now they can go to the grocery store, they can run errands and it doesn't just have to be medical um, care. The hours still stay the same. Telluride again, they're automatically eligible. Um, they can give us a call if they have any questions or concerns with actually using the service. Um, and the only other thing that we have found to be somewhat of a thing where we have to kind of talk folks through it is you do have to have a debit or a credit card to use the service. 
Um, with Uber, it's completely app-based. With YouServe, it is completely representative-based. So they will talk to someone. And a lot of times customers feel a little bit better by doing that. Um, this area in purple that you see here, this is the entire Carta service area. Um, and that includes the three-fourth of a mile uh, inclusion off of our routes, which is the Telerite service area. Okay, so we're going to move on very quickly. Um, low country van pool. Um, again, this is something that I've brought to you guys in the past <laughs> um, and to kind of let you know that it is available. But we do know that as things are changing now, that gas is, is definitely something that is, is a very top of mind awareness type of topic. And so we want to make sure we bring this back to you guys as well. Um, there are a few criteria to actually starting a van pool, but it's really, once you get going, it's really easy and simple. We need at least four passengers to start it. Um, it does not matter whether it's Monday through Friday, th Tuesday through Sunday, it depends on what their shifts are. Um, usually those four people will need to stay in the same proximity and they will need to be traveling to the same proximity. Um, and it has to be for commuter purposes. It can't be a shuttle service. It can't be a driver that you hire. The drivers actually have to be commuting as well. We usually require at least a driver and a backup driver. Um, and right now the introductory rate is only $30 per person per month. Um, and so that is an absolute fantastic deal. I know most of us can't fill our tanks with $30. So this is absolutely great. If you guys have any questions about this particular program, um, I've got Miss Courtney's information up here and I'll make sure to get this to Rachel um, and Christine as well so that they can make sure that they get it out and you can communicate with her. Um, going on to the next slide, it kind of piggybacks onto Low Country Van Pool because Van Pool is part of the whole Low Country Go program. And so just as a reminder, this is the platform that you would be able to go on and um, register. There's a free registration. You go ahead and sign up and get an account. Um, this is the same site that we are able to use, whether you want a carpool, bike, walk, Van Pool, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and we're going to get a lot more engaged with this site uh, just because we're getting again our staffing up. So we'll be able to do a whole lot more, hopefully have different contests and whatnot. So this is even outside of MUSC. If someone just in general wanted to look for a van pool or wanted to start a van pool, just wanted to get interest out there, this is where you would start. Um, this is also required for the emergency ride home program, which is available if you use any type of alternative transportation um, and you're registered on the site. So if you use Carter currently, again, you need to make sure you're registered here. And if you have an emergency home, we will pay for it up to three times a year. Um, and that's also a part of the Van Pool program. And we'd be happy to come out uh, now that, again, uh, we're having a lot more in-person activities and discuss that with you guys coming up. Um, coming very soon, um, we within weeks now, and I know I've been talking to you guys about the different things that we are adding on, mobile pay will be coming soon where you do not have to have a cash on hand, no contact, you'll be able to pay with your phone. You'll be able to purchase the pass on your phone and actually pay with your phone. Um, and that will be available for all of our routes and our Telerad services. And so you'll be hearing more to come about that um, in the coming weeks. Right now, the goal is to actually be able to introduce this and kind of give you guys an educational, you know, um, uh, information on this in about three to four weeks. It'll be on our website. So you'll start hearing about this, but just letting you know that it is coming very soon. Um, it may not affect a whole lot of you guys initially because we know that you guys show your ID to get on, um, but eventually that may be something that we may move to this platform. And so you'd be showing that instead of your ID. But again, that's more information to come. Um, and then very quickly, just the last few face coverings um, had the mandate has extended to April 18th. Um, so we will have some flyers and posters going up just to remind everyone to please have their face coverings on while they are riding the bus. Beach Reach is returning for a new season. That'll be starting on Memorial Day weekend. Um, and we have a host of different activities and committees that you guys can be a part of. I know that a lot of you guys are very passionate about a lot of different things and um, specifically green initiative, transit oriented type things. Um, our Adopt a Stop program is definitely still um, going. Give us a call, give us an email if you have any questions. Our Transit Ambassador, that's a volunteer program um, where you actually can be an ambassador and kind of answer Answer questions where you are and we have different ways you can um, volunteer in that way and we also have some 
positions available in our Transit Rider Advisory Committee, which is also known as TRAC. Um, and that's the committee that a lot of times we bring information to. We pass it through that committee as riders to give us real feedback. They also give us information that they are seeing out there in the general public. Um, and with that, try to go through as quickly as I could um, to hopefully not take up too much of your time, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for all that great information. We do have one comment. It says, thank you, Carta. I love taking the 102 route to and from school. Would be nice if it ran more than once an hour, but still very grateful that it's there and free. <laughs> Wonderful. And that was 102 that they ride? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great. Any other questions you can just put in the chat and we'll try to get to if we have time. But right now we're going to move on to our next speaker, which is Jason Kronsberg from the city of Charleston. <laughs> I'm going to give everybody a, um, a verbal update on where we are with the Ashby River Crossing project. Um, <clears throat> again, my name is Jason Kronsberg. I'm the director of the Parks Department for the city of Charleston. Um, real quickly, some, some of you might be asking, well, why is the Parks Department providing this update? Well, the Parks Department in the city is a unique department. We have three specialized divisions. We have capital projects where we design and build most of our city facilities as well as perform our capital maintenance. Then we have facilities maintenance and then we have grounds maintenance. So we have a very robust capital campaign. It's about a five year plan where we look at public safety facilities, recreation facilities and all civic buildings together. Uh, we build fire stations, um, police facilities, parks, rec centers, uh, we're building the African American Museum, which is near, nearing completion. We just finished the uh, police forensics building built, building out on um, Bees Ferry Road. Uh, fire Station 11, we have a number of fire stations we're getting ready to start. So that's <clears throat> a brief snapshot of our capital projects division. And our facilities maintenance uh, staff, we maintain over 3 million square feet of buildings every year and grounds maintenance, which is uh, parks maintenance, urban forestry, horticulture, and keep Charleston beautiful, have over 100 parks. So we're very busy over here in the parks department. Um, that's just a brief overview of, of, of the city of Charleston Parks Department, but it is a bit of a unique scenario. So back to the um, Ashley River Crossing project. So uh, if you don't know, in 2019, the city of Charleston was awarded a direct federal grant from the Federal Highways Administration, which is not a typical scenario. It's usually uh, state level grants that are provided. So we've learned a lot over the past year with the change of administration or past two years, I should say, change of administration, dealing with the pandemic. It's It's been a, quite a, a large learning curve for us here in the Parks Department on how to manage this direct uh, federal grant. So with that said, and I don't have any pictures for you, I'm sorry, but um, we're well underway into the process due to the pandemic and some of the administrative changes. Our um, our obligation date was awarded a 12 month extension. So what that means is um, this year, um, what is it? Uh, October 30th, we have to issue the request for proposals. So where have we been? We have been through a NEPA process. We've done a lot of surveying. We've done a lot of the bathymetric surveying, which is the underwater surveying. Um, we've conducted um, online public meetings and um, we've, we've started into a base design scope. So we have we have a base design established, which is basically a 14 foot wide bike ped bridge that is really about getting bicyclists and pedestrians across the river safely. It's, this is a safety project. So um, as we were working on the base design, we did went through a, a request for qualifications. So we advertised for uh, qualification statements for from um, design build teams. Uh, we had we received those statements of qualifications and we've shortlisted <clears throat> two design build teams. So that was a process that we had a full selection committee through the city's procurement policy, also working with the FHWA and the, the South Carolina Department of Transportation as they have been um, very valuable uh, mentors through this process, if you will. So um, 
as we as we work on drafting the, the request for proposals that will go to the two shortlisted listed teams, there's been a lot of permitting work behind the scenes. Uh, we've submitted our permit to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We've submitted our um, OCRM permitting, and we've just most recently submitted our um, U.S. Coast Guard permit to build uh, the bike ped bridge over the nav navigable channel of the Ashley River. So that's the, again, there's there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. We have a, a great design team um, with environmental consultants, engineers, and um, uh, working on the project. We have a, a weekly update meeting, and so uh, we are well into the process. Um, so our next step is to finalize the request for proposals. So that that proposal is currently being drafted. It explains everything that the the two shortlisted design build teams will be presenting to us, and um, we will have some industry information days with those two teams after that propose the request for proposals is submitted, and then as soon as you know, so that proposal will be based on the thirty percent drawings for this bike ped bridge. That's when more of the hard work starts. The two shortlisted teams will take that request for proposal and they will bring drawings to about a 90% uh, submittal. So they will they will take probably three to five months and they will actually take those drawings from 30% and they will design the project. And they will then submit those proposals back to the city and then uh, the selection committee will analyze those promote proposals and then we will award the project to the most uh, qualified and and um, or we've already gone through the qualification statements to the most responsive and responsible bidder at that point in time. So um, again, our obligation date to issue that RFP is is uh, October of this year. And um, like I said, lots of work going on behind the scenes. I know that was a lot of words, um, a lot of kind of big picture things happening behind the scenes, but we're well on our way to making this project a reality. Awesome, thank you so much for being here and giving that update. We do have one question in the chat from Elizabeth. She said, geographically, where will the bike pedestrian bridge connect on each side? So great, great question. It will be on the south side of the existing Legree Bridge, which is the newer bridge across the Ashley River. So it'll it'll leave. So the intersection of Lockwood and B will be kind of the 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 touchdown on the peninsula side, and then on the West Ashley side will be um, just beyond uh, that uh, North Brown entrance to the um, Legree Bridge. So the bridge will cross the Ashley River and then it'll come down on the shoulder uh, adjacent to the Round Holiday Inn. And then it'll tie back in through our uh, park at 25 Folly Road and then back around those apartments at the corner of Albemarle and Folly. Um, we have an easement back around there and then it'll connect up to the West Ashley Greenway. Perfect. Thank you very much. Somebody else said thank you. They look forward to cycling across the, the river without fear. <laughs> so this will be great. Um, I do have one question. So you said that the, des the design will kind of continue the process starting in October. Do you have any idea of the end date of this whole project? <laughs> uh, so if the obligation date is uh, 22, I think we're hopeful to get a contract through city council um, at the end of, of this year, maybe the beginning of next, best case scenario, and then I think construction's about two to three years after that, okay. in, in duration. So yeah. hopefully 2025, don't quote me on that, with the pandemic, and hopefully we're coming out of that and we're freeing up in our daily work. Um, you know, there's been a lot of challenges in the construction industry over the past couple of years, so, um, but we're hopeful that we'll have something by 25. Awesome, sounds good. Well, thank you so much again. We are gonna move on to our next speakers, which are Jay Henderson and Brittany Eason with the MUSC Transportation Department. Hey, Justin. 
Um, yes. so I will not speak for very long. I just have a couple of brief updates uh, from our transportation team. Um, one of the things I like to do when I do these sorts of presentations is I just like to remind people of who transportation is, uh, especially in our community, because it's really misunderstood. So we really have three major functions. One is that we transport all of our employees, students, and staff from our parking areas in the Haygood area uh, to campus. But we also purchase a majority of the owned vehicles or leased vehicles that we operate at the university, uh, which typically ranges from 150 to 200 vehicles every year. Um, and finally, we transport patients around the medical district and sometimes to their homes. Um, so my updates are that one of the projects that we've had a lot of conversations about, but we've just really started to dig into is to start electrifying some of our fleet. Um, we, we've talked a lot about this and kind of where we go from there. And we're really going to start with our owned and leased vehicle fleet. So these are the cars that we see a lot around the medical district that have uh, state tags. And so we've been working with state fleet management, which is the state agency that governs our procurement process um, in order to get more, ve more electric vehicles on the state contracts. And so now when departments are requesting new vehicles, we're actually starting to push those electric vehicles. Um, to date, since we've started pushing those things back in January, we've had about five departments request electric vehicles, uh, which is a really exciting number um, because previously we've only had one electric vehicle in our fleet. Um, and so we really started a concerted push towards creating those offerings to departments as they're talking about it. And the state has been really gracious and uh, effective in getting those vehicles on state contract. Additionally, um, to those fleet vehicles that we're operating, we're going to start electrifying our transportation fleet um, and we're starting with our patient transport vehicles. And so during the next fiscal year, we've committed to purchasing two new patient transport vans um, and those will all be hybrid vehicles. And so that's kind of the place where we decided to start because it is the smaller portion of our fleet. Um, and so it is a lot easier for us to wrap our heads around getting those electrified as opposed to uh, the larger buses. Um, the final update I really wanted to make and really the reason why Brittany is here is she is brand new to our team um, and so is her position. Um, her position is to facilitate our communications with you guys with our customer base. Um, along with our external partners like Michelle and John from Carta. Um, so she's going to be uh, making her rounds and getting to know folks, uh, but she'll also be conducting little pulse surveys to figure out what are the things that you guys would like to see us working on in the transportation realm. Um, we've had several conversations with Christine and her team about how we can uh, really start get the ball rolling for electrifying our bus fleet. Uh, which is somewhere where we have finally started to dedicate a lot of energy. Um, but Brittany's role is going to be really keen in getting more feedback directly from our um, customer base. And so I'm really excited about that. We already have some QR codes that are going up on the buses for people to give us some initial feedback. Those things would be, you'll see those on all of our buses by the end of, or by the middle of April, I'm sorry. Um, and so we're really just starting a phase where we're trying to govern our transportation based off the needs of our customers, as opposed to uh, some of the metrics that we use internally, because they don't always put vehicles where they need to be for our, our for our population that we serve. Uh, so we're really just trying to dedicate a lot of energy towards getting customer feedback. Um, like I said, I was going to be brief, so I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Um, but we're just really excited about this opportunity to start electrifying our fleet and to start really soliciting feedback from the MUSC family. Perfect. That is really exciting. So with the new electric fleet, is that going to mean that there are going to be electric charging stations implemented at MUSC? <laughs> <laughs> so that is my favorite question. Um, <laughs> and I try to avoid it whenever people bring it up. Uh, <laughs> So for us, we would not be setting up charging stations in the medical district. 
Um, our buses and our vehicles are actually housed um, in North Charleston. We have a whole facility here. Um, and so the vehicles that we typically operate would be um, would be charging here. So we will have charging infrastructure here, but not in the medical district as of yet. Okay, so just be in North Charleston. Yes. Okay. Steve has a question as well. So there have been five requests for electric vehicles in the five departments, but she's wondering how many have actually been purchased. So, so far, um, only one of them has been uh, purchased because as I'm sure you guys know, our procurement system takes an incredibly long time to get anything through. And so typically from the moment departments make requests, we don't actually make the purchases until usually three to six months down the road. Um, and so there's usually a longer lag time there. Okay, thanks. Another question from Kyle. Uh, for you, Jay, does MUSC plan on allowing passengers to track the shuttle routes through the live tracker outside of the JL slash art route that you can currently see? Uh, so the short answer is yes. Um, so we've actually just completed a solicitation for a new GPS service, um, which we plan to really implement closer to the May timeframe. Um, and so that GPS service would allow us to be able to track all of our shuttle routes. Plus, something that is really new is our patient and family shuttle. Um, we'll be able to see those things which move from location to location around our medical district as well. And so now all of the bus related services that we have that we offer as a department will be visible on one app instead of trying to use multiple sources to be able to do that. Um, and so that's really exciting for us and fingers crossed we'll see that um, fully in effect around the beginning of May. Right, sounds good. Any other questions put in chat, um, but we'll go ahead and move on to our next speaker. So thank you very much, Jay and Brittany. Thanks. Next we, yeah, next we have Angie Brown and Gwendolyn Fleming with the MUSC Parking Department. You guys can go ahead and hop on. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. So um, I'm Angie. I'll go first. I'm going to go over a couple of the older things that we currently have going on. Um, but I'll start by just piggybacking on what um, Jay was saying in regards to the charging systems. So as far as um, parking is concerned, the question has been asked um, a few times in regards to charging stations um, and the solar power stations here on campus. Um, at this time, that option is still being discussed. Um, however, we don't see it being an option for um, parkers in the foreseeable future. But um, when the funds and everything come in, um, that would possibly be an option, but it just is not an yeah, option. Right right now are grants, mm -hmm. um, but it's not an option that will be readily available for our parkers. Um, so a couple of things that we do have that some people may already be aware of. Um, Michelle is, as you know, with Carter. So a couple of things that we have partnered with Carter. We have um, the Carter Express Shuttle that is available for our employees and students to utilize. Um, great thing about the Carter Express is it is free for our employees and students. The only thing that you need to access that shuttle is your MUSC ID badge so you can park in a remote location um, depending on where you live and that shuttle will transport you from that location to the uh, Medical University downtown. The best part about it is it does not stop like the regular Carters. It leaves that location and it comes straight um, to the Medical University. Um, another thing that we have that we offer our employees, we have the Cancer for Carter program. Um, with that program, anyone that can utilize the Carter shuttle and they are currently paying for monthly parking, you can cancel your monthly parking and utilize the Carter um, Express shuttle, excuse me, um, at no charge. We'll cancel your payroll deductions, but at any time that Carter shuttle is no longer available to you, we will give you your space back without you having to maintain a position on the waiting list. 
And also, we will give you 15 free day passes for any days that you may have to um, drive down the campus. Um, and the best part about those day passes is they never expire. So if you don't use it this month or next month, they're still good until you actually use them. Um, we have an option for carpooling. So carpooling would be for any employees that are coming from the same route. Um, you can partner with someone that already has a monthly assignment and you would ride in together. Um, instead of using your MUSC ID badge to access your parking location, you would actually be issued a generic parking card. So whoever is driving that particular day um, would have access to that parking space without having to press the call button or needing assistance to get in and out of the parking garage. Um, and there's only one payment, so even though there's two different people associated with this account, only one person would actually be paying for it. Um, for those employees and students that are biking back and forth, um, there are multiple bike racks all over campus. Um, from my understanding, there are over 200 available spaces for um, bicycles here on campus. Um, we also have free parking for those that utilize um, motorcycles or mopeds. Um, those locations are here in the President Street Garage, closer to public safety, and there's also one in the McCollum Banks um, parking garage. I think that is mostly what we had going on currently. Um, I'll let Ms. Fleming let you guys know what we have coming up. Um, that we're implementing in our new system. Okay, hello. I'm Ms. Fleming, um, just new to parking management, a new position as an office manager, so I'm really glad for an invite. Um, so the piece that I would like to speak about is our new parking system, which I think the organization sustainability program be really excited about because the office will be able to go paperless uh, with our new parking system. Um, currently, when we're issuing some of the passes for um, our garages, we are going to a um, identification via the license plate as opposed to having to issue temporary passes or special passes that may be for someone who has a disability or a, uh, vendors or contractors who park. We are actually going completely 100% to um, using a paperless system as far as all of the garages are concerned or into the flat lots. So um, our customers would just have to provide us the usual profile information if they're new to the campus. Um, once we get the identification information for the vehicle, um, that process should probably, from what I'm understanding, be in place 100 percent, probably by the fall of this year. So we started with it. I think the one thing that um, probably would be beneficial as well with the paperless system that the um, park is, um, or office has in place is being able to go to musc.ames.parking so that they won't have to come to the office to do any type of changes on the vehicle or the tag or anything like that. And so we're just really excited to see that happen. So in the office, we're going um, paperless as well because most parkers receive probably three to four documents initially if they're coming on campus about pre-tax and the policies and procedures. So what we have in place in the office now, um, and Angie plays a big part of that with the wait list and various specialty type parking situations we have. Um, instead of having so many passes, we can just go ahead and input that information. Parkers don't have to come to the office. If they have questions, they can reach out to Angie directly or just go on to the um, AIM system and put any questions or concerns they may have um, about their vehicles. So when you come to the office now, you won't have to have those documents because we have um, set up a electronic signature pad on our counter. So once we get your parking information, profile information, you will automatically have an uh, email sent to you with those same policies and procedures that you would have had before, which is probably three or four documents. And um, we're just really super excited about that. And so far, that's been a big win for the parking office when people come in and say, you know, hey, are you kidding me? No, give us your electronic signature and we'll take care of the rest of it from there. If anyone has any questions for us, please. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, put your questions in the chat. Thank you guys so much. Those are really exciting updates. Um, in the meantime, if anybody puts a question in the chat, I'll let you know, but uh, we'll go ahead and move on to our last segment, which is regarding the bike share in Charleston. Okay, so we have a few minutes left here at the end to give a little update on the Lime e-bikes that are coming to Charleston. So I spoke on the phone with Robert Somerville, who is the Director of Traffic and Transport with the City of Charleston, to get all of this information. So like I said, it will be Lime e-bikes. Robert said that they should be available starting April 1st. It was supposed to be the first week of March, but there were a bunch of shipping delays uh, as everything is delayed after COVID. Um, so a little context on this, the bike share in Charleston used to be Holy Spokes. Their contract ended sometime in the fall, and I think that they were having connectivity issues even the month prior to their contract ending. So uh, that kind of explains the gap in between then and now where there has not been a bike share, uh, so shipping delays, everything like that. Um, Lime is going to be using the same bike racks as Holy Spokes. Um, I think we have a picture of that on our website out somewhere, um, a map of all of the Holy Spokes locations. So those will be the new Lime locations. They said that they are planning to expand. So meaning both in the peninsula, they're gonna create some new racks, but they're also planning to expand around Charleston. So that's gonna include Daniel Island, Johns Island, James Island, and West Ashley, which will be really exciting. And we will definitely be posting more information as we have it on our social media and our newsletter and everything like that. Um, we do really wanna promote this. We don't have a comment on whether it will be the same partnership as Holy Spokes had with MUSC. So we will be giving updates on that as they come as well. Uh, so we have one minute left. If there are any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll try to answer them. Um, otherwise, thank you all very much for spending part of your St. Patrick's Day with us. I also realized that we forgot to introduce ourselves. I am Rachel Whitbeck, the Sustainability Assistant here at MUSC. And Christine von Kalnitz, my supervisor, uh, the manager of the sustainability department is also here in the next room. All right, we do have one question. Will there be something set up with Lyme like there was with Holy Spokes where MUSC students slash employees have some amount of free riding? We don't have a comment on that right now. Uh, we do know that the partnership is being discussed right now, um, but we can't really comment on what it will be or when, um, because those details are still being sorted out. All right, if there are no other questions, we will go ahead and sign off. Thank you again, everyone for coming and have a great St. Patrick's Day.